I'm Pete McCall, and on, today on All About Fitness, it's fun to catch up with, with an old, old friend and an author, Ms. Melanie Webb. Melanie, how are you doing today? And, and thank you for taking the time to join me. I'm doing great, Pete, and thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, so with people, it's fun, to, to, Mel, it's, it's so fun to do this. And, and of course, you're Melanie, but I, I've known you for a while, so I'm going to call you Mel. What's fun is when I catch up with old friends and colleagues who are now doing different things in the fitness industry. So how far does our relationship go back for listeners? I'll let you describe it a little bit. You know, I was thinking about this myself, trying to track it back. I I know where it started. I'd have to work, we'll have to work together on the year, but I'm going to put us in the Sports Club LA in Washington, D.C., circa 2004 to 2008 is when I was there. And what I remember is you coming in to lead certification courses for us. Yeah, no, I was, so I was an instructor there for a while when I lived in D.C. I was a group fitness instructor and that's when you first started working there and I would have put it another year or two earlier. So I'm sure 2004 is right. In fact, now that I think about it, I think you started right about the same time as Kareem. And just so you know, he's going to be another uh, Sports Club LA alum, alum that, we, that I speak with soon. And for oh, listeners, that's Kareem, uh, Kareem Abdul Al-Jabbar, who uh, played football in the NFL before he became a personal trainer. But I think, didn't you and Kareem start about the same time, if I'm remembering? I think we did. We did. And we went through the NASM Advantage Trainer course the first time when, okay. when that was rolled out to the club. So he and I were the first batch. I want to say there were five or six of us that, that jumped on board and did that. So yeah, Kareem, definitely a colleague. And um, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm in touch with a number of our colleagues from there as well. And it's like really fan- phenomenal, fantastic group of people. It is. It is so fun to, to see, to have worked in an area like D.C. And, and now see so many people doing different things. You no, know, like it's funny. You remember, you know, Christy, obviously, who is the fitness manager. I think she might have hired you. Yes, um, and Christy and I stay in touch. We both work on a program through NASM together. And so and, okay. and I stay in touch with her and her husband. Who, they're now up in, in Maryland. But we're not there to talk about Sports Club LA because where are you originally from? I think it's so cool because I don't know that many people from your state, as I was kind of telling you before I hit your record. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Orem, Utah, which is on the Wasatch Front under the shadow of an 11,000 foot mountain about one hour south of Salt Lake City, if you know where that is. So when I was growing up, it was very, it wasn't rural. I would, it was very suburbia, you know, but I was surrounded by orchards and um, farmers. And, um, at that time where, you know, Utah was distinct. It, now it's all a suburban sprawl, but, um, everything was separate at that time. Well, what many people don't know, and, and the reason why I know Orem, Utah is Orem is my middle name. It's a, a, a Scottish name from, it was my father's middle name. So, really? my father, I I, yeah, so I, I'm technically Peter Orem McCall. So <laughs> that is, uh, nobody better copy my, my name now and use it to, to hack into things. So what, and what did you do like growing up? I think it's because I grew up in suburbia. I mean, you, you're talking about suburbia, but you are out in the middle of the, the wilds of Utah, even though you're around, you, you were in a re- residential area. But I grew up in like suburbia right outside of Washington, D.C. What was it like growing up with access to the Wasatch Range and to being around so much nature? It was wild. I, I would say we were just very all natural, wild kids, you know, Um like um, the things our parents allowed us to do were, um, you know, go up the canyons, go to the lakes, ride our bikes. I mean, you know, um, so whereas DC is like, you know, extremely urban packed in that whole area, that was not how mine was. Like this was a very, you know, each city was distinct and you had to drive through the fields to get to the next one. So I felt um, it was a very safe upbringing and we just, we're absolutely outdoors all the time. Um, I personally did not grow up skiing because my siblings and I were ball sport athletes. Mm. So uh, I played volleyball and softball. My brothers and sisters um, played primarily basketball, but our coaches really, coaches really didn't like the kids to ski because if you broke a leg or something skiing, all, you know, their team is in trouble. So um, I didn't start with the outdoor ad- adrenaline kind of sports until I got out of high school. And, and where did you, so, but did you do any hiking or camping or any of that growing up? I mean, that, I think oh, that yeah. was one of the cool things about being in that area. And what, oh, yeah. did you guys go out just hiking or, I mean, what was that like? 
A lot. So, so I should preface this by saying my dad, so my dad was a biology teacher, human mm-hmm. anatomy, AP biology. He graded the AP biology tests. He won the science teacher of America award once. Oh, cool. So, so I was his little protege basically, but all four of us, um, you know, in the summertime, since he didn't teach school, he worked for the forest service or the fishing game. And so my dad was also a big outdoorsman. So yeah, we grew up in the summers since he was a teacher going camping. And a lot of that was in Southern Utah um, and then trips out to California. And they were all very science-based, you know, since <laughs> if your dad's a science teacher, you're always going to be like hands-on learning about your environment. And, um, but yeah, we, my dad was a hiker also at the time when I was little. And so, yeah, we hiked mountains and uh, I mean, these are mountains, right? I remember yeah. when I moved to DC, my you know, coworkers would be like, you know, Mel, these, these, these are mountains too. Appalachians don't hold a candle. The, the, the Appalachians don't hold a candle to, uh, to what it's out in Utah. It's very, it's just very different. This mountain range is much younger. It's much more raw and jet, you know, a lot more rocky and dangerous, frankly. <laughs> so. I did, well, I, did, I obviously didn't know that about your dad. I think that's so cool. And it's, Cool to hear you brag on him a little bit. I think that's, I mean, to, to win teacher of the year. And just, yeah. just so I can tell you, Mel, I'm a girl dad. I have two girls. And and I don't know if you know this. I mean, do you live near your dad now, now that you're back in Utah? We're about an hour away from each other now. Do mm-hmm. so you still see him relatively often? Yeah, I see him several. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say every single month, but I, I get down there. Yeah. But you see him, see him often enough. Well, I, the reason why I say that is just so you know, you I, I know you're, you're a full grown adult. But your dad is always looking at you like you're that little three year old holding on to, you know, holding, holding his two fingers with your hand. Cause I know, no, and I, I told my daughters that no matter how old you become, no matter how successful you become, as a father, I'm always gonna look at you as that little two to three year old holding. I mean, just so you know, that's, that's where your dad, who loves you and supports you to the end of the days, your dad is always gonna look at you as that, as that little girl. Do you ever, do you get that sense? Am I wrong in that? I get that sense every time I bring a guy home. <laughs> he just won't have anything to do with them. <laughs> like he's just over it. <laughs> well, just just so you know, that's what's going through his mind when he sees it. When he sees a guy come in, I'm sure I'm sure you, you're dating nice gentlemen who are very who who are are very good guys. But as a dad, he's going. It's just my little three year old there. This is my yeah. little three year old. Well, yeah, I mean, I just, I just let you know now that I'm, now that I'm in those shoes of, of knowing what that's like with a girl. Well, I think that's cool. Now, where do you live now? Because we knew each other from D.C. and we've each migrated out to the West Coast. Yeah. But obviously, I'm in Southern California and you're back in Utah. But what part of Utah? I'm in Park City now. So I, I like to say, you know, when I first came back here, I didn't really know where to land. <laughs> so initially, I was in Southern Utah for a while. And I've kind of moved my way around this giant mountain range. So, uh, but I am in Park City now where I just love the lifestyle up here. I'm only 30 minutes to Salt Lake City. And, um, but I can be skiing in 10 minutes if I want to. Do you have a season pass? Do you have a pass? Yeah. Yeah. And now I have a vague recollection. Am I wrong in this? Do I remember you having a cast? I want to say your arm. It was that from (laughs) snowboarding once upon a time? No, that was an old softball injury, actually. So softball and volleyball players get lax shoulders okay. and they dislocate. So actually, and you do remember correctly, I had okay. a surgery when I was in DC to stop it from dislocating. Um, basically, I, I was playing in one of those competitive red red sippy cup or Zippo cup softball oh. leagues on the mall <laughs> and okay. swung the bat. And this was, you know, I'd been playing baseball or softball since I was like seven years old and I was about I was 30 at this time and my shoulder just ripped out of the socket oof, 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 oof. it was a bad one and um I worked for a long time with physical therapists to get it to stop dislocating and it just it didn't it would pop out when I sneezed and so anyway yeah I had surgery it was a pretty major surgery there yeah I remember you being in a cast for a while but maybe that maybe because I knew you're a snowboarder that that's that's why I associated with it. For some reason, I thought it was a snowboarding injury. Um, I think the snowboarding didn't help. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> it oh, didn't yeah. help, but it did happen swinging the baseball bat. So, oh, really? That That's what caused it? Breaker. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, just, I didn't realize that. Now, are you a skier or a snowboarder? I should, should ask that. Well, that's a good question. I snowboarded for about 20 years and 
which sounds like a really, now I sound super old, but now I switched over to skiing about four years ago because I just needed to watch myself learn a new sport. Like mm. my athlete brain and body needed to adapt and be challenged. And, you know, when you lay in bed at night and rehearse your performance and like think about how you can improve. And I, as a snowboarder, I just wasn't getting that anymore. And and I also, that part of me that has a shoulder that dislocates, like, I just really didn't want any more of those body slam falls. Even if you get one a year, it's still one a year, you know? So I just felt it was the right time to start learning to ski. Interesting. No, because I grew up, I grew up skiing, but of course, East Coast Hills, nothing like, nothing like what you have in, in Park City. And I haven't gone back to the snow. The funny thing as a high, as a kid in high school, I did a lot more days in the snow than I have as an adult, and I had no money back then. But now it's the time, right? It's like, do I really want to take two days, three days to go somewhere and go skiing and and, and do that? So it's not really like I, you know, it's just hasn't been that important to me. Now, one of the things, Mel, that, that I want to have you on the on the podcast for because we've been connected through Facebook, and what what I really have enjoyed seeing is this business that you've evolved, that this business that you've grown into. And talk about that a little bit because you you do fitness, you're still a personal trainer, but you've kind of evolved at a whole nother business. What what are you doing now? What, what did you kind of grow into when you returned back to Utah? Well, what I, what I grew, it's funny, what I grew into actually started in DC, but it came out of my roots of being from here and this lifestyle that I felt like I had missed. You know, like moving from somewhere like this, uh, where there's really a nice work play balance and then going to DC where all of a sudden it was just work, 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 and I could squeeze in a run, but then it was work, work, work. And so I would frequently take adventure trips and my clients would watch me go do these things. And they eventually started either wanting to come with me or asking me to plan their own trip and guide them. And so I started putting the root whole fitness adventure my business and I remember coming up with the name I was driving somewhere I think I was going to form the LLC and I called my brother I was like I don't know what to call this thing and so we just came up with that name on the fly Soul Fitness Adventures and it was basically a, formed as a boutique tour operator with the you know the slogan is like where health and wellness meets the outdoors and so um, and it, and it evolved like basically these bucket list trips, but I would train my clients and get them ready for it. And then I would take them on it. And, and once I moved out West again, now all of a sudden I could really access it on a regular basis. It was no longer just let's plan a big trip six months out and go do it. It was like, okay, now I can really do this as part of the integrated training for my clients. Um, well, well, let's take a step back real quick and talk about where we were in DC at the sports club LA because it wasn't just a regular health club. I mean, it was where, where the health club was, it was part of the Ritz-Carlton complex. It's now Equinox bought the clubs in 2014, I think it was. And it was part of, you had, you had the Ritz-Carlton hotel complex, and then you had the Ritz-Carlton um, condominium complex. And right. in the condominium, that's where Michael Jordan lived when he was, when he was in DC. And then I think Fred Smith, Fred Smith the owner of, um, the owner of, Fred, of uh, FedEx, had a condo in that building as well, had a condo in that development. So we were working and we had access to, and also to the Bush daughters. We were there during the Bush administration, the Bush daughters, because I remember Monica would tell me that the Bush daughters would come to her Tuesday night class. And so I just want I want people to know that that's the type of health club that we were working in. So it was working with, with members and with clients who had access to resources. So you started, so what kind of, what kind of vacations did clients want you to help them plan? What, what, where'd you get started with? Great question. So my very first one ever, uh, and this was a re this was really fun for me. Um, I had a number of clients who would go sign on to big group trips with big tour operators and go international and go cycling and wine tasting, right? Um, and and then they would come back, or they would go to the big spa retreats like um, Rancho La Puerta, or um, you know, these five day immersions. And then they'd come back and be like, well, I didn't really love it. Like I was just plugged into their program and they weren't doing what I wanted to do. Right. They weren't these private customized experiences. And so because of the resources these clients had, and because so many of them were self-made business people themselves, they kind of started pushing me to like, 
go a business route. I think they pr- might have seen my I had an entrepreneurial nature, I guess, but I didn't know what I was doing. And so one basically one it was one client. Her name was Jessie, and she had a niece that was graduating from college, and she wanted to take her on a really memorable trip together. And their family skis, and they're a very active family, but she wanted to come to Utah and she wanted to see it in the summertime because mm. my, if I remember they ski here in the winter, but they'd never been here in the summer. And so, um, and I was mentioned, they wanted it to be several days. And I was mentioning this to another client who says to me, well, you know, I own a hotel at Deer Valley, right? <laughs> and I, I was like, oh wait, you're, oh yeah, you're that family that owns hotels and ski resorts in Utah. And so, um, you know, so she taught me how you work with the hotel to create that partnership. And then the other woman basically taught me like what she did on these trips that she would hire and pay these big tour operators on. And then I took my own background of growing up in these wild places and guiding from being a biologist was a big part of my work in that field. So it really just came very natural to me once I had the mentoring uh, and building blocks and actually a a client who lived in the Ritz Carlton residences was a luxury travel um, travel agent at the time. Oh wow! So she taught me how to make margins. <laughs> priced out. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So, well, yeah. margins. Why? Why are those important? What? What are margins? Yeah, because. Yeah, I would have done it for free just to say, like, oh, I get to go home and go hiking for a few days. Um, but yeah, so I just was surrounded by these awesome mentors, basically. That's so cool. Now, real quick, it's funny you mentioned Rancho La Puerta. So I'm going to do a quick plug here, but I just signed on. Um, I'll be announcing this later on the podcast in future episodes, but I'm going to actually be doing a week there in September of 2021 to with the with the, the release of uh, Ageless Intensity. So I'll be doing a full week at, at Rancho La Puerta as one of the guest instructors and a guest speaker of where I'll be going through and talking about smarter workouts and talking about Ageless Intensity. So for listeners, you can kind of keep an eye on that. Rancho La Puerta is this great spa just over the border near Tecate, Mexico. And they'll you fly into San Diego Airport, the bus picks you up, and you spend a wonderful week at a resort in, and I didn't even think about the smell as we were getting ready for this, but you said Rancho La Puerta. So I figured, hey, plug, plug, plug. Okay. Um, yeah, but so I'll have, uh, so for listeners, I'll have information on that about if you want to schedule a great vacation, San Diego is beautiful in, in, in September and be a great time just to get away and, and we should be able to travel by then. Now, I want to come back. Now we're coming back to you, Mel. We're going to come back and focus on you. Um, well, first, I have to say congratulations. Oh, because thank you. Because they have a phenomenal reputation. I mean, they're one of the first destination spas in the U.S. at that caliber. So that is no small nod to you and your work. Oh, well, thank you. And then what I'll do is uh, I also will put you in touch. I need to follow up with them anyway to just finish up the paperwork. But I'd be more than happy to put you in touch with them, too, because I think you'd be perfect for doing that type of work. I mean, and that's and that, I mean, that's one of the hidden things. I mean, that's why I, it's funny, Monica, and you knew my ex-wife a little bit, but Monica and I, we didn't have kids right away because we were living in D.C. and she would go on these resort trips. So um, maybe one to three times a year, we'd go to do a week in a resort in Jamaica or somewhere in the Caribbean where she was the guest instructor and we got to stay for free. So what people don't realize about the fitness industry is there's this whole underground economy of us being able to go be a personal trainer or be a visiting instructor. Did you ever do any of that before you started SoulFit? You know, I never did. I started thinking about it last year, actually, right before COVID shut everything down. I was speaking to a man who he's kind of like the broker between fitness people and these really luxury properties around the world. And we were mm. talking about that. And, um, and then it, I just, you know, unfortunately got shut down, but it's something I've thought about a lot. Cause I think you'd be perfect at that. Now, I want to, again, I'm going to come back to you. I just, I, listeners might not be aware of that there are they wait, you guys, you guys are fit. You get to wear sweatpants for, for work, for a living, and you get to go on these killer resort vacations. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is one of the nice things. But one of the things that I didn't bring this up yet, but I think it's so cool in your background, Mel. What did you study in college? Well, first, where did you go to college? I don't. I, I know I saw that in your bio, but it's not off the top of my head. Well, so I, I started at a small state school called Dixie State University in southern Utah. Um, the town has grown a lot since I was there, but it's in – in the very southwestern corner of the state called St. George. And it's only an hour and a half away from Las Vegas, Mm -hmm. which was really great as a college student. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) We had Las Vegas an hour and a half in one direction and Zion National Park 40 minutes in the other direction. Wow. And 
I mean, it was Mojave Desert, Red Rock. We just, you know, studied really hard, uh, my friends and I, and then we just mountain biked, rock climbed, explored, like it was wild and great. So I did my first two years there, um, graduated with an associate of, associate of life sciences, transferred to Brigham Young University in Provo, um, where I was accepted into the athletic training program. And at the time, and I imagine they still do, but they had an extremely highly, um, highly accredited competitive athletic training program. And I wanted to be a physical therapist. Um, so getting into that program was awesome. And I transferred to BYU, which was where I was close to where I grew up, which I, you know, I really didn't want to go to college where I grew up. Yeah. yeah. I think everyone wants that college experience where they go away, but that's where the program was. So I came back home, went to BYU and somewhere in that program, maybe, maybe a year and a half in, you know, at the time it was like, what you had to do like 2000 volunteer hour internship. And I kind of started seeing the writing on the wall. There were two female athletic trainers in the NCAA at the time. And I just, and you, you know, the average athletic trainer was coming out, um, working as a high school athletic trainer and then full-time teaching on top of that. And my, because my dad was a teacher, I'd seen how hard that was. And I was like, I I don't want to do that. And so I switched gears and I ended up graduating. Um, I ended up going into zoology pre-med basically. So I had like three and a half years of physical therapy bound life sciences. And I ended up graduating with a degree in human biology and developmental physiology. Hmm. So I basically picked up some really hard sciences in genetics, evolution, um, natural history. And um, so I came out really prepared to go either direction whether I followed the human body route or the biology route. And that's kind of what I've done. I can't seem to pull one foot ever completely out of the other. Well, real quick, I just want to, for listeners, I want to talk about what an athletic trainer does. Because I I think a lot of people hear athletic trainer and they think like either strength coach or personal trainer. But a strength coach works with athletes to get athletes strong for playing their sport. The goal of a strength coach, the role of a strength coach is to keep athletes on the field and injury free. The role of a personal trainer is we help clients achieve whatever goals they have in front of them. But what exactly does an athletic trainer do? How is an athletic trainer different from those other two? Oh, great question. Well, what I would say is they have the ability to like, you know, if you see athletes come out and they're all taped up, if they have an injury, you're doing some modality work, like hot, cold treatments, um, taping joints, assessing injury on the site, like so you're an athletic trainer is at the games, at the practices, making sure those athletes are safe and that if something does happen, they're getting care immediately and getting sent to the proper, um, you know, I mean, not like, like an NFL is going to have a team doctor on the sidelines, right? Um, but working with athletes to keep them healthy and safe and deal with injuries, what I would, how I would well, answer. Well, no, that, that's, that's exactly it. Because when you look at it, I mean, people get the idea, especially if, if you, I mean, you're, you're a pretty high competitive high school athlete yeah. and you see that and you're like, oh, that looks like a great job. But for listeners, being a high school athletic trainer is, I've seen, I mean, as a rugby coach, you know, we see, we have to have them on the sidelines. That's a miserable job because if you're an athletic trainer for a school, you're there, you're working with all the programs, you're getting kids taped up. I mean, it's a tough, tough job. So it's a lot different than personal training. I just wanted to, I wanted to make that distinction because people might hear, I've heard people reference to us as personal trainers as athletic trainers. It's like, no, we're not athletic trainers. And I've heard people reference to strength coaches as athletic trainers. It's like, no, those are different worlds. So I just wanted to take a moment to, to separate those worlds. But what did you do for a couple of years um, before you got into fitness full time? What was your, cause I think that's such a cool thing. Yeah, well, so I graduated from college, right? It took me five and a half years by the time I got out with, the, with that mixed bag of, of specialties. And um, after I took a year off to ski and travel and backpack, cause I was so burned out. I, I went in and I became a wildlife biologist. So I went to work for the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, went back to St. George as my base. And I specialized in uh, working with endangered fish and amphibian species. So we were like the native aquatics department. And, you know, the rest of Utah was all big game, right? Like 
deer, mountain lions, moose hunting. It's kind of a hunting state. And so in Southern Utah, my uniform was a pair of Tevas and some river shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> and, and we basically, um, but we had a massive area. So it was everywhere west of the Colorado River and everywhere, uh, and we, then we went north along the Nevada border up into what's called the West Desert. Mm. And these are wild areas. Just, you could have a hundred miles without civilization easily. Um, and our job was to fish species, which were really amazing species, like one of a kind in the world that were really endangered because of the pressure being put on the water resources in a state like Utah, which is constantly in a drought, right? Um, and so for three years, basically, I did that work and, um, you know, got to the, got promotions and became a manager and would hire my crews. And then we would go out. I did a lot of camping at that time. So I might be camping for six weeks in the spring and another six wow. weeks in the fall. And we basically, if anyone has ever heard of the Zion Narrows, it's kind of a bucket list, big hike that people like to do. Um, that's the Virgin River, which is part of the Colorado River drainage. And we basically would walk every inch of that river, making sure that the fish were not um, going extinct, basically. So but a lot of science research data, number crunching, but also just incredible amounts of time being outside. And see, I had no idea. I, you know, I'd look into your bio. That that sounds honestly, that sounds like such a cool job now, right? Yeah. I mean, after we've been in the industry, after we've been working for a number of years, it's like, wait, I would love to be away from people living, living in the wilderness and doing that. So it sets you up well now. I didn't realize you had such an extensive background. So now with what you do with, with the Soul Fit Adventures, do you train people? I mean, I'm sure last year is an anomaly. 2020 is an anomaly. So 2020 aside, do you work with people specifically to go on adventures? How does that, how does your business operate? Like what is, what structure does it have? That's a good question. I'll tell you this. It's evolved a lot since those days. Um, early on after I left DC and came back here and I really just dug in and put the, you know, put the framework around it. And it was, um, a lot of multi, my specialty was multi-day trips and it was a lot of Utah national parks because that was such a destination for people. So it became some, there were times when I, there were years where I didn't work as a personal trainer at all, but I was attracting travelers who wanted active vacations with someone with my skill sets, if that makes sense. So I could really tailor these experiences to their fitness levels and I could be coaching them along the way. So say we did a core workout in the morning in some spectacular outdoor space, and then we would explore it doing whatever, hiking, biking, stand up paddling, and then do meditation and they'd get a massage and all that. And I'd say it's evolved a lot. And to the point where a couple of years ago, um, I went to Mexico with a man for three weeks who just really needed to change his life. Like he needed to get away from home radically break away from some bad habits and remind himself that he has a relationship with his body, you know, and for him, um, he actually, it was an amazing experience. And we talked a lot about my reaching a point where I really did not want to be traveling all the time anymore. And um, it wasn't sustainable me wearing all the hats, you know, it was like, how do I, how do I scale this thing? It became a real business thing. Um, and so I've kind of morphed it now to where I, I'm, the, I'm the performance coach working with power players in recovery. And we're going to do that with the nature immersion. Oh, cool. I like so that. So nature becomes the healer, right? And we spend like slow time out there. And whatever recovery is, whether it's injury or substances or work, been workaholic for 30 years, you know, so that it's a better pace on my body now. Also, I'm not trying to keep up with year-round active vacations like I, I learned the hard way that I needed rest also um kind of drove myself I ended up getting adrenal fatigue one year when I guided wow. too much. yeah which is where I also had to learn balance you know <laughs> well in a dream for, for listeners adrenal fatigue is a severe case of overtraining that just is from being too active your body doesn't doesn't recover so let me get this right you were overtrained from taking people on vacation is that i mean and i'm not i'm not making light of that but I, I can see of where you're just constantly 
especially as a trainer, especially from the type of person I remember you being, Melanie, is you're very giving and you're very focused on your clients. So I could see how doing what you're doing would lead to, to that fatigue. So your business now, do, you, do people hire you to get, I mean, how does that work now? What, what's, the, what's different about it? Yeah, so the difference um, I rarely put out is I rarely put out a set of dates that says like, "Hey, come to this trip I'm doing." I I haven't been successful at all in that model, which you know you see a lot of people being very successful at that, and I'm always like, "How come I can't do that?" But I think it's because who I am as a person, and and as thank you for that compliment. Like I'm all there with that client like like I am very giving and supportive, and and something about my nature really gets behind people in that setting, like probably that athletic trainer that studied the injuries and the healing and the part of me that's been injured a lot, I can really bring that forward and support people. So yeah, they're basically coming to me saying, hey, I'm coming off of whatever this thing is and I'm trying to create this new lifestyle and good habits around it and I really need some support right now. Um, and so I'm integrating with their medical team if there is one uh, most of the time there is one and there was, you know, a lot of trainers know this, that your clients probably have a physical therapist or an orthopedic surgeon at some point in time. And you've got to communicate with them and find out what the contraindications are. And um, it's just all, it, it's really amazing because it's all of my background coming together and it's all of my life experiences coming together. And it means I don't do the same volume of clients that I used to. Um, like now I and I probably only have them for a short period of time um, before they're weaned and ready to go. Um, but that's a better pace for me now than after burnout like I've had with the constant travel. And now I can travel again because I want to. <laughs> I know that the poor me, right? I got yeah. I just to travel so much. But like it is a grind. And these vacations, those, the big active vacations, they could be like you know, six, seven hours a day of exercise. And when you're doing that 10 days in a row, over and over and over again throughout the year, it's just, um, like I said, it, it wasn't a sustainable model for me. So I've morphed it now into a model that I can, I think I can grow old with this one. <laughs> but we're not getting older. No, we're staying the same. Everybody else is changing. We're, we're staying the same. Now, real quick, what's, what are the benefits? What are the, you talk about recovery and different methods of recovery. But why is nature so important? What is it? What's so restorative about getting out on the trails, whether it's for a hike or whether it's for a mountain bike? But what, what's so restorative? And is there any science behind that about being in nature? That's such a great question. And it's summed up actually in one word, which people may or not have heard before. It's called biophilia. Hmm. And biophilia was... Um, first created, or I would say coined by a psychoanalyst called Eric Fromm, and then a biologist named um, E.O. Wilson, who is a famous ecologist and he's done some amazing research, uh, did that term, but it basically means that humans have an innate genetic need to have a connection to nature. And this is a, like, it's like, might as well be like a law of science, right? <laughs> it's like, and I'm fascinated by the fact that we don't learn this in exercise science or exercise physiology classes. We just, it's not part of the curriculum. And for whatever reason, it's separated into biology, right? But me having had all of this diversity of education, this was always a compliment for me. There was never was a separation. And also the way I was raised by a father who taught AP biology right alongside human anatomy, right? Like, um, um, anyway, basically we are of the earth, right? We are nature, we're 80% water and the rest of us is minerals. And- Interesting, I like, I like hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay there for a second. Okay. So, so basically look at I me, mean, cause what there's that old saying when somebody gets put in the ground, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And I knew the part about water, but, it, but I never really thought about it, Mel, in terms of minerals, but you're, you're absolutely, I mean, Bones are calcium. We have, you know, we have a, an enormous amount of sodium in our body for optimal muscle function. I like that. I like. That. Sorry, I'm just going to be now. I'm be meditating on that. You know, we here we are. <laughs> we're the rest. We're, we're we're majority water than the rest minerals. But and so, what's that mean for our body? Why is it so important to be be in nature? Well, what it means is that nature really harmonizes us, and and I mean in really cool ways research that has come out and been done by scientists on this very thing. 
what is happening to the human mind when we are in water, when we're in a green forest and not even in water, but even just looking at it, the brain creates different chemicals. Like our brains have a response to just looking at nature. They've actually found that the most calming landscape there is, is something like the Serengeti, like a prairie. Hmm. Um, and, and what they found is that evolutionarily back in the day, you needed to be able to see predators coming. You needed to be able to see your enemy coming. So if you could be on a landscape where that was just flat with views miles and miles away, you had a feeling of safety and security. And, and it's really interesting because this is our evolution, right? This is how so many centuries were thousands and thousands of years of our human ancestors lived. So that is in our DNA, it's in our genes but now we're just kind of industrialized and we're not interacting with our nature as much anymore. So huh. um, what I'm advocating for is let's, this is biology, this is how we're meant to be living with a connection, like a real personal hands-on connection to nature. Well, I'm just sick because we're talking for a minute or two before I hit record. And I know listeners, you said you you've heard some of my podcasts where I talk about mountain biking. But that's one of the things I love about where I ride is I ride on, it's, it's, it's in the coastal range in North County, San Diego. And it's about, it's not, it's not far, but it's, it's, a, it's a 40 minute climb. But at the top of the climb, you see, I can see all the way to Dana Point, which is up in Southern Orange County. I can see down to the islands, which are part of, part of Mexico. I guess that makes me qualified to run for a vice president on the Republican ticket if I want to go, <laughs> if I want to go a little political, because I can see Mexico from my mountain. Just the reasoning crosshairs, okay. No, exactly, right? No, but but the point is, I mean, there's something so satisfying, Mel, about when I get to the top of the hill, no matter how many times I've been up it, whether I bike up it, whether I hike up it, there's something, I'm just thinking about it now, there's something very soul satisfying about seeing that view, about seeing that panorama of the Pacific Ocean in front, the I don't the the, the mountains in South Orange County to, to my north, the mountains of Mexico down to my left to, to the south. There's something very satisfying, and it's very interesting to hear you say that this is innate in our nature. What do your clients say after your clients spend a few days with you, whether they're going through slot canyons or whether they're paddle boarding? What's the response your clients give you about being about being able to engage in nature? They're just totally different human beings. I mean, honestly, speaking of aging, they look 10 years younger. Um, most of the time, if, if I can, if I can get them to a slot canyon, cell phones don't work. Typically. <laughs> and so you watch them go through this metamorphosis of initially it's like, oh my gosh, I don't have service. And then, like, yeah, right? like, and then all of a sudden it's permission to put that thing away. And uh, which we all need, I think. Um, and, and all of a sudden, yeah, just the years come off, literally. And, and one, so I've heard clients say before, like they can exhale now, like, mm. like they're just running around in this fight or flight, holding their breath stage. And all of a sudden they're like, ah, oh, right? Like it feels like relaxation. And um, it's really cool to watch that process. Well, with, with everything in the last year with, with COVID and I don't, I'm trying to move beyond that. But I really think one, one of the benefits about the past year is, is, look, for those of us that make a living in health clubs and gyms and studios, this has been a very challenging year. But if you take that aside, I think one of the best things about it is it got people outside again. I mean, there have been, I've seen a number of different articles just about how I, a number of people are roller skating now. I, I see more and more people on Instagram sharing things about roller skating. Bike trails, the mountain bike trails here in San Diego are just busy as heck. And wow. bikes, bike stores were sold out for a little while. How do you, do you think that one of the hidden blessings of COVID, Mel, in the past year, do you think that one of those, um, one, one of the hidden blessings is the fact that people made a return to nature? Oh, yes, I agree with that. And it's been a lot of fun following the research, hasn't it? And the articles coming out like, like, hey, this is what's happening. Like, now there's this massive demand for nature. And you know, the national parks in Southern Utah just got absolutely overrun by people getting there finally for the first time. Like finally they had time. Finally they weren't all, maybe all the kids soccer games on the weekends and families could do something wow. different. Yeah, yeah. This over scheduling that we've all been living in. Um, I don't know about you, but man, I don't ever want to go back to being so over scheduled. And I've heard you talk about like, 
that you didn't really miss the travel. Like you got to spend every day with your girls. And um, I feel the same way. I don't, I, I finally got to put some roots down really deep, you know? And um, yeah, the, the numbers don't lie. There's all kinds of studies coming out or, or you know, the research, even the fitness industry is showing this, the adventure travel industry is showing this, you know? And yes, we're, you and me, like in my business, travel and fitness, talk about two sectors that just got nailed right like yeah. <laughs> it's been a rough year we have to pivot and um adapt and everything as we catch our breath but also the outdoor industry is showing data like hard goods just went through the roof uh, you can't get a bike i mean the they were if you didn't have a bike by last june you were not going to get one stand up paddle boards are sold out um um, and I think it's fantastic. I just think it's really great that there's the opportunity in this really difficult <laughs> last 15 months or so, right? Is like, well, what are we going to do now if we can't go inside to move our bodies? Like, where are we going to do that? And I think it's, it shows also like people, there's something happening out there that's making them want to go do it again. Well, right? that you have people leaving the cities, like people are moving out of Los Angeles and droves. People have left San Francisco, people have left Manhattan, and they're moving out because now that we, now that workforce is, because what I've been told by people in business who, who are much smarter than I, but what I've been told is that we are looking, I mean, going forward, majority of the workforce is going to remain remote because why would a business pay for five floors of office space when they can have a remote workforce and pay for maybe one floor of office space and be able to save X amount of money on overhead? Do you think that's going to change our fitness habits? I think there's an opportunity for it too. And I'll tell you what I hope it doesn't do. I mean, what I, I, I know 71,000 apps in the fitness and wellness space were published on the Apple store last year. Wow. 71,000. And I know this because I'm working on an app myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm keeping track of things. But, um, you know, we saw what Pelot you couldn't get a Peloton bike. Um, I fear that part of the change that we're going to see that doesn't reverse itself is people retreating more and more behind the screen. Mm. And, you know, I mean, every, so many fitness trainers, if you weren't already in the online space, which is, we all need to be, let's just admit it. We, yeah. you know, that's, that's the way this is going. But if you weren't already there, you were probably desperately trying to figure out how to be there. And, you know, to help people, like we said, like it's kind of a giving profession. We're just in it to help other people and share our love of the body and of health and movement. But um, I hope it doesn't stay a permanent thing because I, we all know that we already have a mental health crisis in this country and we do not need to spend more time all by ourselves behind another screen. No. Well, to come back to that, I interviewed a number of years ago, I interviewed John Wolf, who's the chief fitness officer and on it. And he talked about our hands are made for tools. And for listeners, I mean, we're, we're talking via video, so I'm holding up my hands doing jazz hands, and listeners can't see that. But our hands were made for tools. They weren't made for screens. They weren't made for keyboards. So you're kind of, so you're kind of, I think, tapping into that innate, that, that some kind of innate physiology that we just we overlooked, that we didn't realize that, that we were missing. Now you took your information, and one of the reasons why I wanted to speak with you. Um, is you you took all this information and you wrote you wrote a book and it's adventures in mother's Na mother nature's gym what was it what what caused you to write that book and what do people get out of reading that um i'll be honest somebody approached me and uh one of the fitness certifying bodies approached me and said hey we like what you're doing and why don't you write a book oh and i'll back up first i wrote an article that got published in the idea fitness journal and um, like I approached them and I said, I saw an article that had been published and I said, what do you think? I, I would love to take that topic a little deeper and share what I've been doing. And they gave me the opportunity and that I heard from clients around the, or from trainers around the country who wanted to lead their own trips, who didn't know how to do it. So they reached out and I helped a couple of trainers get their trips up and running. And I was like, wow. People, there's there's other people out there who want to do this, you know, and um and then the fitness the other uh a, a friend of mine who was my fitness manager when I lived in Mammoth Lakes was working for this fitness certifying body and sorry the acronym's not coming to me right now they're not right. one of the big ones and um 
And so she reached out and said, hey, we, we like what you're doing. Why don't you work with us? And we'll be your marketing distribution partner. And that was a number of years ago, actually. And, um, and I was like, well, I never thought about it, but I'd love to try, right? And I had some writing chops from my former career as a biologist and environmental consultant. I wrote a lot, actually. And I'd written a couple of short stories as a guide that got published. So oh, cool. writing, writing was one of those skill sets that somehow I have. And so I sat down and I, I actually partnered with, um, at the time I was gonna write it as an interactive online platform, um, which was kind of ahead of its time. Now that's pretty common, but six years ago, it really wasn't. And I partnered with some educational they were what master's degree in educational technology or something. So they helped, they guided me how this thing should be ordered. And you know this from writing your books, like, okay, so you have all this information in your head and you need to bre do a brain dump, but how do you organize the thing? Um, and so I worked with them and they guided me um, in how to make this thing a proper course. Um, but it was really, the writing process went very quickly. It took me about six weeks. To cool. just sit down and say what have I been doing and who do I look to for research and let me cite them and so there's you know several pages of citations in the back and um it's been a bumpy road I finally finally published self-published it um a year ago a year and a half ago and it's on paperback on uh paperback on amazon.com where it's available to everybody and I hope consumers and people interested in this will read it also and then I've created a course uh, out of it as well for personal trainers. And that's Wait, all. You, have a, you got a book on Am Amazon sells books? What, really? You know, crazy. <laughs> no, I mean, considering that's what, that's what it started at. And what can people learn? I mean, what do people learn from Adventures in Mother Nature's Gym? I mean, a lot of listeners out there might be, well, I'm not a personal trainer, but they might be interested in, in taking an adventure vacation because I don't know if you, you, you realize this, you, you probably do, but one of the biggest things to blow up in the last year, maybe a couple of years, uh, is overland camping where people have, they have tents now on their vehicles. I was wondering what all those things were. I, I started seeing on the tops of trucks and Jeeps. So you have overland camping, and then you have these killer vans, like the Mercedes Sprinter vans. Oh, yeah. They're like upwards of $100,000. You know, $100, and so you have this whole evolution now of people looking to get outside. But what, what can people learn? Is it, Can consumers get something out of Adventures in, Mother, Adventures in Mother's Nature's Gym? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that. The answer is yes. And, and I actually just sent the book on a, tr on a trip with a travel writer who is camping her way down the south. And, I, and she's actually a fitness person too. And I said, hey, I would love to send you this book as your road companion. And you can be staying consciously healthy as you're doing this thing, right? And so what's in the book, I break it down into basically mind, body, nature. So it's full of meditations and different mindfulness activities that you can do in green spaces, in water spaces. And then I include the desert because that's where I spend so much of my time. Um, the idea is, okay, you know, like I realized I can't just go, go, go all the time. Like recovery is an essential part of my well-being, right? So say somebody's out there cycling and I mean, we could try it with you. You take your, your, uh, did you say 40 miles? 40 minute, 40, 40 minutes. Minute, yeah, not 40 miles. <laughs> <laughs> straight, then, well, it's straight uphill for 40 minutes and downhill for 15. So yeah, yeah I wouldn't be able to do that for 40 miles, but thank you. Um, but it's like, okay, so, so what's something you could do as you're looking at the ocean that not to say that just been looking at it is not enough because it absolutely is, but you can go deeper. And if you're a family out there with kids and you want them to know about the planet and you want to instill in them, uh, an ethos that cares about the planet beyond just plain eating organic food and recycling, right? Like, no, what is this planet and what, you know, if we're made out of it how can we actually interact with it? So there's a bunch of activities like that in the book. And there's, and it talks about like, what's happening up here. Okay. Like um, what are, what are some of the names of our chemical of the chemicals that our brain's releasing that actually causes us to be relaxed if you're interested in that. But then what it does, there's actual trip planning tools in here. Like, okay, well, how do I pick a place in my own, forget about go, doing some massive trip, right? What's in my own backyard? What's, where's a state park within an hour of my house that me and the kids can go to for half a day? And what are we gonna do when we're there? And maybe what is a workout we can do before we paddle so that 
we don't get so sore because we sit at a desk all week and now this is going to be an activity. So there's also an exercise library with about 40 exercises in there, just mine, just the mat workouts, you know. Um, and that's part of what I'm adapting to put into an app too. So um, that's the gist of it, mind, body, nature, these three things and how do we, how do they interplay with each other? Well, I love that, Mel. And, and and from watching you from a distance again via Facebook, I'm not stalking you. Don't don't don't. Get no, no, we're Facebook friends. But yeah. but yeah, but but watching you from a distance and seeing you post on that, I'm I'm approaching fifty. I turned forty nine this year. My kids are young. They're they're in first and third <clears throat> first and third grade. They'll be in second and fourth grade next year. And I'm really looking ahead in the next ten years. And there's a whole trail network from right here you would know it i'm like pointing to it like you can see it for, for for people that might see us on youtube i'm pointing to it but there's a whole trail network that goes from about um solana beach all the way up into the hills up in in east san diego county they're putting together a series of trails that you can do and so what i've told my daughters is like as you get older i'm trying to get them into like little day hikes then i love that you said start local you don't need to plan some huge adventure vacation but I'm trying to get my daughters. So what I want to be able to do with them is as I hit 50 and they hit their teens, if they want to spend time with their dad, I'm hoping they do, but that we can go out and do some of these hikes. I want to do this whole trail. I don't want to do it all at one time, but I want to do it in chunks and make that our goal as they get older together and, and be able to do that. And one of the things that we did recently for spring break was I took them up to Joshua Tree. I'd gone to Joshua Tree quite a few times when I was in college in Southern California. And it was so cool to go back to Joshua Tree and to take them there. And, and I just had a very loose plan. Both daughters like to climb. I always went and climbed a couple piles of rocks. But real quick, as we get ready to wrap up, what is it? Why is being in the desert so transformative? Every time I'm in the desert, whether I'm on a bike or whether I'm just hiking around, I don't know if it's the smell of the dirt, just the wide open space. You kind of you talked about it a little bit earlier and it got me thinking because you referenced the desert, desert one or two times. But every time I'm in the desert, Mel, I just feel downregulated. What? What? Can you talk a little bit about? You, you mentioned the brain chemistry. Yeah. What could be going on in our brain that that causes that feeling of just like as soon as we leave the car and we're there and we smell it and we see the wide open spans, what's happening in our brain as a result? I love that you just asked that question, and I just barely tapped into my own desert experience a couple of weeks ago. Like I was just really overwhelmed for some reason. Like some kind of information overload, right? Was going on in my head. And I was like, I just need to go to the desert. <laughs> so like, I went down there and I can tell you exactly what is happening there. And it's really cool. It's called the Schumann resonance. So there was a scientist at NASA, his last name was Schumann. And he discovered that the earth has a resonance, mm. right? Like a frequency that it is emitting. And if you think about it, this is not Woo, this is not some woo woo weird thing. Like everything's a matter of chemical and mechanical exchanges, right? Chemistry, things in our body, airwaves, frequency. Um, so the earth has a magnetic gravitational pull, right? It has a frequency that matches the beta relaxed state in our brain. Wow. And I remember a doctor, so she wrote the foreword to my book. Her name's Karen Koffler and she's an integrative uh, physician who's now at uh, University of Miami. Um, but I met her when I was in Canyon Ranch in Miami Beach years ago. Um, and she brought her kids out to Utah for a desert trip after I got to know her and I guided them around the desert for a few days. And she's the one who taught me about that. And I had never heard this, but I'd experienced the same thing you were talking about. And I'd seen it happen to my clients. Like, what is this like calm that's coming over me? And so that's when I went in and did the research and found that literally they have found it's the same hertz. It's like seven, I'm gonna get the number wrong. I, I made an Instagram post about this recently. It's like, uh, for your listeners, I don't, I don't, I'm afraid to throw out the wrong number, right? But it's like seven point something hertz is the frequency that the earth emits. It's also the beta, uh, the beta brain wave, which is our relaxation. And what I think so again, not to sound all woo-woo, but I have heard the frequency when I'm in the desert before. Like I'll be laying in my sleeping bag and, and you hear this like bzzz. <laughs> and they'll look around. There's not, an, there's not an electric line in sight. There's nothing, but you can hear it when you get into that relaxed state. Well, so, if, if I remember meditation, if I remember reading about meditation, I mean, we have theta, we have theta brainwaves, we have beta brainwaves, 
And one of the things about meditation is we're tapping into our beta brainwave. And that's one of the things I've done sometimes on a hike or on a mountain bike is I'll take five minutes and just meditate a little bit just to kind of, it is funny you say that because it's not woo woo. Everything huh. emits an electrical frequency. Everything is on a certain frequency, oscillating on a certain hertz or megahertz. And what I try to do sometimes, I'm not successful all the time, but at least sometimes I make the conscious effort, Mel, is I try to have that meditation of just kind of like getting in resonance with with where, where I am and just kind of tapping into that energy. And it's amazing that even just for a few minutes, just thinking about it now, I can kind of feel my body downregulate a little bit. And is that why, I mean, that that's why you build meditation in your book, obviously, correct? Yes. Yes, 100%. We need that down regulation. We are so in our, you know, we're par our sympathetic nervous system in our, in our lives right now, the way we're living. So yeah, 100%. That's why I added that because number one, I started seeing it happen in my clients and I was like, what is going on? And I just, to be I realized like, okay, I'm just the facilitator here. There's something magical happening here that I actually have nothing to do with. I'm just setting the stage so that people can have a safe experience. I'll, I'll put the framework to it, but let me just get them out there and the earth will do its thing. And that comes back to biophilia and our genetic need and desire to have a connection to nature. Just put yourself out there and it's gonna happen. You don't have to work. These tools in here will help you if you need a little help to get started. Um, but, but exactly, just think of it as resonance. I think anyone who goes to the ocean has felt this too. It's, that's a really easy place to tap into it. Well, I can tell you there's a hill in, in Encinitas that I come over that as soon as you crest the hill in a car and you see the Pacific Ocean out in front of you, automatically I can just feel whatever I'm, whatever I'm, you know, whatever, however I might be feeling, I'm usually pretty chill, but even just coming over that hill and seeing the blue of the, of the Pacific Ocean, it just is automatically like, ah, <laughs> you know, I live in North County, San Diego. So what do I have to be stressed about? No, it's funny to hear, but it's funny to hear you put that. And it, and to wrap it up here, Mel, I want to say a huge thank you for I, when I saw the book had come out and following your work, I, I, I put it in my mind. I actually wrote it down on a list I keep of potential guests that I wanted to have you on in spring of 2021 because I wanted you to get people like motivated to go outside. So I'm a little late in contacting you, but we're going to post this in May of 2021. So I really, it's so funny because I can't remember if I was hiking or on a mountain bike and all of a sudden, boom, I was like, I got to contact Melanie. I got to get in. And then literally within 24 hours, you sent me that message. So whatever frequency we were operating on, we were on the same vibe. So I want to say thank you for that reminder. Um, and then, but where can people get more information about what you're doing? Where can people, obviously they can find uh, mother adventures and mother's, mother's nature gym. I'm saying, I'm saying that wrong. I don't know why I can't it's a mouthful. Say you know it's a mouthful mother nature's gym <laughs> mother 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 nature's i have it written as mother's nature maybe that's why i put the apostrophe s in yeah. there and i should i have mother's apostrophe s instead of mother, mother nature nature's. that that that's my mistake i apologize but adventures in mother nature's gym oh. that's available on amazon but what what are your websites and where can people get more information about what you're doing and if they want to and i know you're doing something different but they want to, to speak with you about setting up their own adventure vacation yeah Give them the information so people can find out about that. Oh, I'd love that. Yeah. And and I'd absolutely love to have have people. Now they can come to me in Park City. That's the cool thing about living in Park City. <laughs> I can cool still do it without traveling myself. So, yeah. So, yeah, please visit my website. It's webwell.com. W-E-B-B-W-E-L-L.com. And uh, I have a Facebook group, which I would love to invite people to as well. It's called Mother Nature's Gym Online Oasis. And I'm trying to just share, you know, share health and wellness tips and things like that there. And I'm on Instagram at Soul Fit Adventure, and that's S O L Fit Adventure. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have all that linked down below in the show. And Mel, it's so much fun. It's been a number of years since we've seen each other, and, and yeah. being 2D is cool, but being 3D is always even cooler. Um, but it's so fun to see what you've done and to see how you're kind of doing something so different. And I really have to say, this is such a you're doing such a cool powerful thing that I know you're having an effect, not just on the people that you work with, but just putting the energy out there. And again, I'm gonna go a little woo woo, but hey, we I am in Southern California, I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> but you're putting that energy out there. And I know that's having an impact on people. So I want to say thank you for what you're doing. And thank you for taking the time to join me on the podcast. Thank you, Pete. It's been so fun catching up with you. And yes, I'll look forward to catching up in 3D.